much, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you to the organizers for asking me to speak to you this afternoon on how to get funding for clinical trials. Is your name Les or Lise? Uh, Lise, Belinda Lise. <laughs> There are several steps to take before you submit your application for funding for clinical trials. As Professor Angelini has already said, you need to be very specific about defining your scientific question. You need to uh, prepare your outline protocol ready for your application. You need to prepare your budget carefully, and you need to select your funder carefully. And I'll talk a little bit about each of these steps during this presentation. So the first thing, the very, very first thing, is to perform your literature search. And it's very important to do this so, as Professor Angelini says, that you know what is known and what is unknown. I'd also strongly recommend that you check the registered clinical trial databases for other ongoing trials. It's critically important you discuss your idea with experts in the area to ensure that what you're going to look at is going to be clinically important and relevant. If you're going to perform specific measurements in your clinical trial, I advise you to um, spend time consulting with specialists in those measurements, for example, echo, MRI, and any pathology measurements. If you have access to a clinical trials unit within your institution, again, I would strongly recommend you consult with them very early on to discuss the type of study design that you might look at, observational case control or a randomized study. They will also be able to advise you on the likely outcomes of your trial. And it's very important that you consult with a statistician to determine the sample size. And this is absolutely critical because your sample size will determine if you're going to have a single center study that you can perform in your own institution only or whether you need to make a multi-center trial and possibly whether it's going to be national or international. For example, if you wanted to look at a trial in Marfan syndrome, which is a reasonably unusual syndrome, and you, your sample size was 800 patients, then almost certainly you would need to have a multi-center trial that was international, because otherwise you wouldn't be able to recruit the number of patients. Another important consideration is to consider the time frame of your trial. If the event rate is rare, you may need many patients and or a long follow-up. And this is important because if you're planning a 10-year trial, say, practice may change and there may be new treatments or strategies that come into effect which will affect your event rate and maybe also the relevance of your study. So next step is to prepare your outline protocol. And a very important a part of this is to spend time on the feasibility. And I really urge you to spend time on this because it's one of the main reasons that trials fail is because they can't recruit the numbers of patients. There are several ways you can do this. You can either look at some audit data for um, data from your institution or to prepare some prospective screening logs to identify the likely number of eligible patients for your trial. But you also need to consider as well as the number of eligible patients, the numbers of patients who will actually enroll into the trial. For example, at our unit, we're helping to coordinate the arts study, and we um, identified that a quarter of patients who are screened were eligible for the trial, but in fact, 28% of those eligible were actually enrolled. Your um, audit data and your screening logs will help you also determine your timelines to be able to recruit your study population. And you may decide actually to do a pilot study in the first instance before doing a full trial. Once you have your feasibility data, this will help you to define and refine your primary and secondary outcomes. You may wish to consider the use of a core lab if your primary outcome is something, for example, like quantitative co um, coronary angiography or IVUS, to try and reduce the inter-center variability. Other outcomes that funders are increasingly um, uh, like to see are things affecting the quality of life of patients. So you may want to consider looking at quality of life questionnaires, disease-specific or generic. And also funders like to see now some health economic analysis of the data. So you may wish to think about involving a health economist in the development. So at this stage, you need to um, subject your outline proposal to clinical experts. I suggest also showing it to study nurses to see if your um, proposed protocol is going to be practical. The trialist, the statistician, any laboratory staff, and any specialists in MRI and ECHO if this is relevant. 
Funders also like to see patient involvement in the design of trials, so you may consider sending it to a patient group, patient user group, or patients to review what you're proposing. A very important aspect when you're applying for funding, uh, funders will want to see, have you considered carefully what are the hazards to patients of your proposed trial? So you need to think about pa patient vulnerability, their capability f for informed consent, particularly if you're doing a study in an emergency situation. What about the intervention you're proposing to use, the drug or device? What are the known, but also you need to think how are you going to capture the unknown adverse effects? You need to think about what assessments you're going to subject patients to, the radiation dose, for example, if you're going to do repeat CT scans. You need to consider carefully any inconvenience or extra burden to patients with extra visits or tests. So for example, if you were doing a study in cabbage surgery and then you wanted to invite patients back for daily bloods post-discharge, that probably would be considered a bit of an unacceptable burden. You need to consider how are you going to protect your patient's data and anonymize your data and ensure that you have appropriate systems in place for reporting any adverse events and communicating any new knowledge about the subject area to the patients and their um, health professionals. So what should you put in your outline protocol? Well, I suggest that you think carefully about an acronym for the study. It gives the trial um, some identity. Always use a protocol version and date. It sounds an obvious thing to say, but when you're reviewing it amongst multiple um, reviewers, it's very easy to lose track of which version you're looking at. Here are some of the things that I suggest that you put in your outline protocol, because if you prepare it in this way, it'll be easier for your application, and then if you are awarded funding, you can go on and do your full um, protocol. The first thing is to have a study summary, just a simple one-page summary of the aims of the study, the uh, methods you propose to use, and the eligibility of the patients. The background information, this is where your literature search comes into play. The objectives and purpose of your study, so your primary and secondary outcomes. What sort of design are you going to look at? How are you going to select your patients? And how are you going to handle any withdrawal of patients? What is your treatment or intervention going to be? How are you going to assess efficacy and safety of your study? Statistics. It's important that you have a, a statistics section. So this will include details of your sample size and also um, details of how you propose to analyze your data. It doesn't need to be very detailed because you will put that separately in a statistical analysis plan later on. You need to think how you're going to capture your data from source to the information and how you're going to record this. What quality assurance systems are you going to have in place? Consider the ethics of the study. This is to do with looking at the hazards to the patient. How are you going to handle your data and record your data? Any financial or insurance issues? How are you going to organize your study? And we'll talk about that in a moment. And also, importantly, even start thinking about a publication policy because that can cause lots of problems later on if it's not disclosed up front. In terms of thinking about the timelines for your application for funding, uh, I can't stress enough how long often applications for funding can take. I've put allow six to 12 months, but actually it can sometimes be even longer than this. You need to build in about six to nine months for your ethics, regulatory, site agreements, and study setup. It sounds a long time, but that's, that's realistic. If you're doing a multi-center trial, you need to allow that sort of time. Your recruitment period, will you'll estimate this from your screening data. Your follow-up will be defined by your protocol. And then I suggest you allow about six months for the closeout data cleaning analysis and reporting and publication of your study. In terms of preparing your budget, you need to think about staff costs and non-staff costs. And not all of these will be applicable, but just to think a little bit about each of these components. Well, you probably will be the chief investigator, so you're responsible for the overall conduct of the study. So you may wish to put some funding there to support your salary. Um, if you can include a trial manager, it's a very good idea because if you're a busy surgeon, you almost certainly won't have time to do the day-to-day -day coordination and management of the trial for all the sites. Think about including funding for the trial monitor to do site visits to ensure compliance with the protocol and accuracy of the data. You will want to have a database developer involved to design and develop your compliance study database and also to think about a data coordinator to help you input the data, raise queries with centers, and ensure the completeness and accuracy of your data. And we've already mentioned about involving the statistician very early on in the sample size, 
but they will also help you with preparing reports for the Data Monitoring Committee and preparing the analysis for presentations and publications. The principal investigator at each site, you may wish to include some funding for that because they are responsible for the conduct of the study at the site. Almost certainly try and include some funding for research nurse at each site to screen, identify and recruit patients, record the data and follow up of patients and they're, they're a sort of contact on a day-to-day -day basis with the patients. You may need to include some funding for specific staff performing the study measurements, so for example if you're doing angiography according to specific study protocols. You may want to include, if you're going to include a core lab, some um, funding for the core lab staff for the central analysis of study-specific measurements. And if you're going to do a health economics on the data, you may wish to include some funding for a health economist to advise and manage on the quality of life questionnaires. As far as non-staff is concerned, you need to think about how you're going to capture your data. Usually this is a case report form, paper or electronic, patient files, computer, printer, telecoms, fax, these are all obvious things, but, but they add up. You need to think about the randomization system, whether you're going to use envelope, telephone, electronic system. Do you need some specific software for your databases? Does the core lab need specialist equipment or software? Do you need specific refrigerators, minus 80 freezers, for example, temperature monitors? Courier costs of sending the materials to study sites? It's a good idea to include a little for the promotion of your trial, for example, to develop a a trial logo, mugs, pens, etc., because it keeps up enthusiasm for the trial. And think about newsletters. Funders would almost certainly want to see that you thought about patient travel costs in your application. You also need to think about the travel costs for your trial managers and coordinators going to the study sites to do training and monitoring and closeout. You need to factor in some funding for investigators meetings, data monitoring committee meetings, and trial steering committee meetings. You need to think about regulatory costs. These can be quite substantial, certainly in the UK. The study drug or device, and that can be very substantial, including the packaging, storage, and dispensing. You need to think about registering your trial and also presenting at scientific meetings any publication costs and the archiving of data at the end. The funders will want to see that you've organized your study well. Um, and a model that we've tended to use at the Clinical Trials Unit at the Royal Brompton is we have a management group for the day-to-day -day running of the trials, so the trial manager, the chief investigator, the data manager, et cetera. And then we appoint a data, um, so trial steering committee who look after the overall conduct of the study. Usually this, they will have an independent chair, have specialists on the committee, and these can be surgeons and they may be um, PIs too. If you're doing a, a surgical study, this is very important. You may wish to include a health economist if you're doing health and economic analysis, a trialist and a statistician. And again, it's a good idea to include a lay member on your committee because again, funders like to, to see that you've involved patients in the conduct of the study as well as the design. And the art study that we're helping to coordinate, which is a big um, surgical study, we've included a patient who's had cabbage surgery who sits on RTSC. You'll also want to appoint a data monitoring committee who look after the safety issues of your trial. Usually there's three to four members independent of the study and because they have access to the unblinded data. They should be experts in the field, so if you're doing a surgical trial, they should be surgeons included, but they cannot be PIs because they have access to the unblinded data. And you should also include a trialist and a statistician. So you've prepared your application, you've prepared your budget, now you apply to your funder. You need to think about which charities are related to your disease area. Um, sometimes there's specific government calls for research and this can be very helpful. And you need to think carefully about the amount of funding that you need for your trial because different streams offer different facilities within their funding body. You need to think about the time frame for your trial. Often project grants are only for three years, so if your trial is 10 years, you'll, you'll need to consider this carefully. With the art study, we have joint charitable government funding, so funding from the British Heart Foundation and the Medical Research Council, and that works very well. If you're going to involve a drug or device in your study, please consider carefully trying to obtain the supply of the drug or device from the company. Um, you can have a sort of mixed model. We've done a study um, in stented versus stentless valves, which was investigator-led, but we had the, the valves were supplied by industry, and that worked very well. You can have a completely commercially-led trial where both the funding and the um, protocol is developed by industry. <laughs>
But a good example of a study we're conducting at the moment is in Marfan syndrome, and the majority of our funding is from the British Heart Foundation, with some funding from Marfan Association. But Sanofi Aventus are kindly providing part of the supply of the study drug, which is Herbisartan, which, as you know, is a licensed drug. And we're actually buying the rest of the study drug, um, including, the, obviously, the placebo. And that's another £250,000. But what I want to bring out here is the fact that the packaging, labeling, and storage of the drug, because it's a clinical trial, these are very, very important factors, it's actually costing us another £250,000 on top. So it's a massive amount of money. And that's why I say if you can obtain the supply from the company, it's a, it's a very good idea. You need to liaise with your R&D department, whoever signs off your grant at your institution, to determine the indemnity costs, um, what procedures are in place, and what timelines they have for sign-off. It's no point taking it to them at the 11th hour. If you're doing a multi-center trial, I really recommend if you can get letters of support from your participating centers with, with um, screening data as well, this can be very helpful. And if you supply them with a template letter, um, again, funders like to see that you've got your support from your participants. And it sounds obvious, but ensure careful peer review before submitting. So in summary, 10 top tips for success. Identify clinically relevant question. Take time to estimate the number of eligible patients. Assemble a multidisciplinary t trial team. Think very carefully about the hazards to patients. Plan your schedule carefully to coincide with clinical care where possible. Allow realistic times for the setup, recruitment, follow up, and close out of your study. And allow sufficient funds in the budget for additional staff or tests. Prepare a detailed outline protocol because this will help you with the application and the full protocol. And select your funders and funding stream that meets the relevant disease area, type of study, costs and timelines. And ensure your application is reviewed by experts in every aspect of the study before submission. And then just finally, I've just put a, oh, some useful websites that I hope may help you when you're preparing your application. Thank you very much.